for the first time in forever, the show that aims to fill the gaps in all of our watch lists. Last week, we took a look at John Hughes's fourth wall breaking, school skipping classic, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And if you haven't seen that video, you can check it out by clicking the link in the description below. But this week, we turn our mince pies onto a group of cheeky geezers trying to get their grubby mitts on some bees and honey. This is lock stock and two smoking barrels. Wait, wait a second. I am going to be talking about spoilers for this film, so consider this your warning now. This is one of them high power jobs, isn't it? Oh. Got some bad news for you, John. What the f? <laughs> Mind your language in front of the boy. Jesus Christ! That includes blasphemy as well. British gangster films have always been an interesting commodity. They first really sparked interest back in 1948 with an adaptation of Graham Greene's novel Brighton Rock starring Richard Attenborough as Pinky Brown. Audiences were taken aback by its depiction of violence but compelled at this underbelly being so viscerally brought to the big screen. And it wasn't long before a slew of British crime movies eventually made their way into cinemas. Some endeavoured to fall in line with the tones set out by Brighton Rock, whereas others aimed for a more jovial approach. But as crime changed across Britain, as did the films to reflect it. Nowadays, British crime films do their best to reflect the society we live in, often powered by racial tensions and societal discourse, typically resulting in harrowing films, uncomfortable for many to watch, because of how realistic the presentation is. Guy Ritchie, on the other hand, sought to lean back on that jovial tone that I referenced earlier. His films were hard-hitting, foul-mouthed and frequently graphic, but predominantly played for laughs and entertainment value. Films like Snatch, Rock and Roller, and more recently The Gentleman, cemented Ritchie as an auteur of British cinema, with his own unique style of filmmaking. Trust me, you know when you're watching a Guy Ritchie film. But like all good auteurs, they have to start somewhere, and for Guy Ritchie, that was Lockstock. There's a lot of moving parts to Lockstock's narrative. Primarily, we follow a quartet of mates, one of whom is in a dodgy game of poker and winds up owing a big-time gangster slash sex shop owner half a million quid. The four of them have to devise a plan to get their hands on this money that eventually involves a neighbouring crime gang, a weed factory and their criminal owners, two hapless scousers, and Vinnie Jones. I say Vinnie Jones. He plays a different character, but come on, let's face it, it's not a push. <laughs> Having already familiarised myself with Richie's work and style prior to watching Lock Sock for the first time, I kind of knew what I was letting myself in for. A large amount of eccentric characters, all with their own monikers, a rapid editing style that moves the film along at a whirlwind pace. Guy Ritchie is basically the UK's answer to Quentin Tarantino, and with Snatch arguably serving as the pinnacle of Ritchie's career, similar to Tarantino and Pulp Fiction, Lock Stock is Ritchie's Reservoir Dogs. Starting off with the characters themselves, they're all equally entertaining, and Ritchie's writing manages to find a unique way to make each of them stand out. The central four of Eddie, Bacon, Tom and Soap are the likeable heroes who find themselves way in over their head. Nick Moran as Eddie is a bit bland and is probably the least interesting out of all the characters, aside from the fact that his dad in the film is only bloody Sting. Before he was fighting The Rock, or fighting giant sharks for that matter, Jason Statham made his acting debut in this film. His performance in Lockstock and Snatch for that matter never really indicated him being a future action movie star. If anything, both of these films showed off some great comedic timing. Tom, played by Jason Fleming, was the Joker of the crew, usually making the mistakes that get them into trouble, and Dexter Fletcher's soap remains this enigma a chef desperate to stay clean despite hints towards a very dodgy past. Like I said, they find themselves deep in debt to P.H. Moriarty's Hatchet Harry, a no-nonsense crime lord who Richie shows his violent nature in a flashback as he beats a man to death with a giant dildo. I also thought it was a nice touch with Moriarty's casting, as he appeared back in 1980 in one of the most influential British crime movies, The Long Good Friday. 
Harry has a trusty heavy called Barry the Baptist who could probably smash your face in with the flick of his pinky as well as debt collector Big Chris. Now, Barry the Baptist has tasked two idiotic scousers with retrieving these antique guns, but they've sold them on to Nick the Greek, who in turn is providing gear for Rory Breaker and his criminal empire. Rory owns a weed factory being run by Poshtoff Winston and his stoner buddies. They then find themselves under attack from another crew led by Dog, who, as luck would have it, is a next door neighbour to Eddie and his mates, and thus the circle is complete. Now that probably sounds like a really complicated narrative, and in the wrong hands, any audience member would have been completely lost. Thankfully, Richie strikes a balance ensuring that each plot thread gets the necessary screen time. There isn't one story that outstays its welcome, nor do any feel like anything is missing. As far as the performances themselves are concerned, there were only really a handful of more well-established actors. For many of them, this was their acting debut, or their big break at least. And it does show in some cases. A lot of the line delivery in this film is very flat and one note. You must be Harry. Sorry, didn't know your father. Never mind, son. You just might meet him if you carry on like that. I'm not completely sure if that was intentional, but as a result, it never truly felt like they were characters as such. Instead, it came across simply like actors reading dialogue. Although there are some standout performances that managed to avoid this trap. Statham is pretty good, as are Fletcher and Fleming. Football's hard man Vinnie Jones turned in a surprising and iconic performance as Big Chris, a brute who will do absolutely anything to protect his son in training. As to be expected, Richie plasters his screenplay with absurd humour and outrageous hijinks that definitely takes it to that line of, of taste, but given that they've set the precedent already, in the opening of the film, you kind of just go along with it. There's plenty of inventive jokes, however, one in particular poking fun at the silliness of Cockney rhyming slang with a direct translation appearing underneath. I don't think, however, it's as endlessly rewatchable as Snatch is. There were points where, towards the opening of the film, and Richie is laying out the roadmap for these characters that are going to gradually collide, that pace isn't as sharp as it could have been. You can also tell that this is a first time director at the helm. I don't think Richie's incredibly saturized color palette served any purpose and actually looked quite cheap. Nevertheless, Richie does stick the landing when it comes to the film's ending. A very apt homage to 1969's The Italian Job, with our plucky crew suddenly realising the worth of the rifles, and Jason Fleming balancing precariously on a bridge trying to retrieve them. It's probably one of the better cliffhangers I've seen in a while. On the whole, I wouldn't go as far to say that Lockstock and Two Smoking Barrels is Guy Ritchie's crowning achievement, but it is a fun, easy-to-watch crime caper. There's plenty of memorable characters and quotes, the intertwined narrative is well executed, culminating in a very thrilling and exciting payoff. So, after watching Lockstock and Two Smoking Barrels for the first time in forever, I can say that it's worth it. Anyway guys, those were my thoughts on that film. Let me know, have you seen Lockstock and Two Smoking Barrels? Uh, is it your favourite Guy Ritchie film or are there others that you prefer? As I said, I really, really love Snatch. I also quite like his Sherlock Holmes films as well. And as always, I hope you have enjoyed this video. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next video. But before I go, here is a teaser for next week's episode. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you have, make sure to click that like button. And if you aren't already, click that subscribe button too.